Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's recording. We are live. All right. Let's talk about anti Parkinson's uh, medications. First, thank you, Linda. See, fur baby. See, now I'm getting a focus. All right. Let's talk about uh, Parkinson's. These are the four faces of Parkinson's disease. I'm sure you guys know Michael J. Fox and the most famous uh, Parkinson's person is Muhammad Ali. Um, at the bottom, it's Freddie Roach for the boxing uh, fans. He's a trainer. And on the left side, this is a basketball player from Miami Heat a few years ago, Brian Grant. He's not as famous as the other people as Michael J. Fox and Ali, but I threw him up there to let you guys know that this can happen at any age. So what is Parkinson's? It's a progressive nervous system disease characterized by tremors, changes in posture, gait, and mask-like facial expression. If you haven't seen videos or clips of Muhammad Ali walking around, when he, when he was at the peak of his uh, Parkinson's disease, this is what it looks like. So this patient with Parkinson's, he is trying very hard to act normal, but he can't. He can barely stand up straight. He's trying to do, I don't know what he's trying to do, but he's, he's doing something and he can't, he has no or minimal control of his um, uh, fine motor movements. He has his friend, friend there across the, the couch trying to talk to him and tell me about your Parkinson and act normal, try to act normal. And he's, he can't, he's having a hard time. And this is the norm for these people. So Parkinson's develops due to loss of dopamine secreting cells. Uh, I think I told you guys already, it may develop. He's moral support. He is actually, who said that? Sasha, I'll, I'll highlight that in a few minutes. They may develop at any age, just like that basketball player I showed you, uh, Brian Grant. I think he was in his early 40s when he got it. And I think Michael J. Fox was in his 50s, same as Muhammad Ali, but most of the patients uh, get it in their um, 50s to 60s. The bad thing about this disease is there is no cure. There's no magic pill. There's no shot. There's no treatment. There's no cure for it. So the treatment is aimed at management of the symptoms. And one of the best, I don't know, it's the best thing. One of the good things with Parkinson's is with that patient that you saw with the previous clip, he was walking around, he was trying to function. Uh, it's, it was very difficult, but his cognition was still there. He was still 100% there, which is great for um, working with, the, with these patients. So how does this disease progress? It starts with uh, the Parkinson's disease causes ataxia. This is a lack of muscle control or co coordination. So they're, they're having a hard time walking, doing things, picking up things. And with this ataxia, it can impair physical mobility and create a self-care deficit, which is a big issue for these um, patients. It also has um, bradykinesia which is the slowness of the movement. It is one of the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And this is a difficulty trying walking. to demonstrate what it looks like trying to walk with Parkinson's disease. He has lack of coordination, rhythmic tremors. He, he's having a hard time standing up and uh, walking, drooling, and affected speech. I don't remember uh, 
Ali's um, speech when um, he was still alive and mask-like expressions. This Brady Kinesia thing, remember that, it is the hallmark of Parkinson's disease. And this is what it looks like. It slows everything down. It's like doing something in super slow-mo. This person is simply trying to untie his shirt. It's a simple task. He knows exactly what to do, but it seems like he's moving in slow motion. So there are theories on causes of Parkinson's disease. Number one, they're thinking maybe it was from a viral infection that they got that went to the brain. Maybe, maybe in Muhammad Ali's case, it was from repeated blows to the head. Maybe, but we don't know because there's also hundreds and thousands of boxers out there that doesn't have it. Um, from brain infection, atherosclerosis, drugs, environmental factors. And we'll skip this. It's about the degeneration of dopamine releasing neurons. So their dopamine is very low. So management of care, how are we gonna take care of these patients? Encourage patients to be active as possible perform exercises, maintain independency with ADLs. Go, it could be as simple as going to the bathroom and going to the kitchen and follow the drug protocols. These drugs that they take normalizes them in a way that they can function a little bit, that they can perform their ADLs. Management. Caregivers should monitor adverse effect. Some of these medications has adverse effects. And the patient is not gonna know if they are, if it's affecting them in a way. So caregiver, it's, that's the caregiver's job. Yeah, this is what, uh, who is it, Julie, or who said that? Sasha said earlier, provide encouragement and support. They need this. So with these patients, these are the goals of therapy. Reduce symptoms. When they take these medications, it reduces symptoms so they can function and allow for more normal movement. They, we want them to function as normal as possible. Yeah. And so as nurses working with these patients, setting up goals for them needs to be specific and measurable. If I have a patient that with the Parkinson's I'm working with, it is unrealistic for me to say that Mr. Jones is gonna be able to return back to normal within a month. Not gonna happen, not feasible, not even close. However, if I say my goal for Mr. Jones is for him to walk 10 feet and 10 feet within two weeks, that is acceptable and very much doable for these patients. And since their cognition is not affected by the disease, they can, they can work with you. They can try harder because you have, their cognition is there to follow your command, follow your instructions. All right, let's talk about drugs. What can we give these patients? What are these medications? that are important because it's here, it's a topic, we're talking about it. So the uh, one is a dopaminergic medication called levodopa. It is for the relief of signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Precursor of dopamine that crosses the blood brain barrier where it is converted to dopamine. Remember their dopamine levels are down. So we need, they need more dopamine. Pharmacokinetics, it was well absorbed in the GI tract, widely distributed in the, uh, in the body because it goes all over the peripherals. 
so they can, it loosens up the muscles, fingers, toes, so they can function. Metabolizes in the liver, cells excreted in the urine and crosses the placenta. Actions, it increases the levels of dopamine in the, in the brain, in the base of the brain. That's all we need to know about that. And when we do that, it helps restore the balance between the inhibitory and stimulating neurons. Um, over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking about balancing, balancing, balancing. And this is pretty much what we're doing when we're talking about brain uh, CNS drugs. So levodopa, this is like the, this is the, the most common drug prescribed for Parkinson's. But, and it is almost always given with this medication called carbidopa. And it's, it's a combination drug called Cinemet. I'm not sure, I think I asked the same question earlier. I'm not sure if this is a, this is a brand, the brand name for this medication. And if it is, if they, it looks like they have a monopoly for this drug. And we'll talk about the Cinemet here in a little bit. Adverse reactions or levodopa, arrhythmia, bad news. So if somebody's uh, on a levodopa, they also have a cardiologist involved because somebody has to be monitoring their, their rhythm, their heart rate, blood pressure, everything else cardiac if they're on this thing. It also causes anxiety, nervousness, headache, blurred vision, and confusion is another one that I forgot to throw it up here. So just imagine your Parkinson's patient getting confused, bad news. Okay, okay, Linda, you need to, we'll get started GoFundMe to get you a new laptop or nursing school, but it's good. Pharmacokinetics, all these medications, um, anxiety and related to the cardiac effects. No, it's something different. It's something that's related with the brain. And it's one of the, uh, that's why we, the caregiver has to monitor this. And as the caregiver, this is your instruction, monitor side effects. Most medications for Parkinson's have the same, works in the GI tract, metabolizes in the liver, excreted in the urine, and crosses the placenta. It's kind of, it's kind of generic. Contraindications for this, just like with any other drug, known allergy. Of course, we're not going to give something this to a patient if they're allergic to it. Glaucoma, angle closure glaucoma because they found out that this they found that this medication causes an increase in intraocular pressure another one a big one is a urinary tract obstruction so if they're having trouble peeing it's a no no especially patients with bph nope 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 it's not even uh, so they need to do um they need to give this patient something else if the patient has BPH. Because it, it will increase the risk for um, urinary retention. BPH, um, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, where there's, oh, I thought I had a, did I have, oh, I thought I had a, a picture up there. I think I took it off. It was where um, your prostate is enlarged so it kind of, you can, your, your, your urethra and uh, so you can't pee as much because there's constr construction there, constriction there. So with these patients, uh, BPH patients, they have a hard time peeing. In fact, when, uh, because of this constriction, it, whenever you guys are get back to the hospital in your clinical setting, if you're putting in a Foley on a patient with BPH, they're gonna require a special Foley. There, thank you, Morgan. 
Ah, good day. Yes, yes, yes. You're Morgan, you're two steps ahead of me. Uh, yeah, you're, they're going to need a special catheter that kind of angles a certain way so we can get past this, uh, so we can get in the uh, bladder. So BPA, but for now, for, for this Parkinson's purposes, I'm sure you probably talk about this BPH in your one of your med surge lectures, but consider this as a down payment. Anybody with a BPH, um, there, Morgan says it, clamps off the male's urethra due to enlargement of the prostate. So they have a, they have a hard time peeing. Karen, I thought I admitted Karen already. So they have a hard time peeing. So they have urinary retention, which is a, uh, that's why it's contraindicated for these patients. Cautions for using this medication. But remember, caution does not mean contraindicated. It just means be careful when your patient is on these things, is on this medication, if they have cardiovascular disease because of the arrhythmia, bronchial asthma, peptic history of peptic ulcer. There's that urinary tract obstruction. Um, be careful with that. This is talking about the early stages of that where it's not complete. They don't have the full-blown BPH yet. Uh, and psych disorders, because it can also cause confusion. Drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Bad news to mix with the levodopa are the MAOIs and, the, and vitamin B6. This is what happens. When you, when you combine levodopa with MAOIs, it markedly, it increases the levodopa tremendously, causing them to have toxic levels of levodopa in the system and can be very serious. On the mixing this, uh, not mixing, combining the levodopa with vitamin B6, they will cancel each other out, leaving no results. Levodopa, this is your drug card. Look at it, read it. A uh, summary of what I just said. Down here at the bottom, cardiac irregularities. Adverse effect is ataxia, but your patient has already had that. Increased tremor, so on. Look this over. I've already said that. Next is carbidopa, frequently given with levodopa in a fixed dose combination called cinnamon. So levodopa works well controlling the symptoms of the patient. If we add if carbidopa to that, it works very, very well for them. For the, so I'll throw this up there. It's like a one-two combination for the, um, for Parkinson's disease. You know why it does that? So it's like a one-two combination. One was okay, but the two combination works much, much better. It does this because carbidopa decreases the metabolism of levodopa in the GI tract. So if there's less metabolism there, it's, that means more of the levodopa can go up to the patient's uh, CNS to the brain so the patient can require less of the medication of the levodopa. And when you can, if we can give the patient less levodopa, that means their side effect will be much lower from the side effects I mentioned earlier. And lower side effect. Other dopaminergic drugs for uh, Parkinsonism, you can look at these, amantadine, pergoglide, ropinolol, these are not as commonly prescribed as the combination I just talked about, the levodopa and the carbidopa. So your problem, I, I don't, rem, I think I may have seen a mantadine in, in my practice, but I haven't seen any of the other ones. Professor? Yes. 
for the sake of the exam, can you just clarify again about if we're going to be studying the trade or the generic names? Generic names. Thank you. Generic name. I think I even changed some of the questions there to generic. So nursing considerations for patients on dopaminergic drugs, history and physical. You need to do a good h &P on these patients, known allergies, if they have GI depression or obstruction, GI urinary, especially BPH is a no-no, and glaucoma. Watch out for these patients with these. Max is the anticholinergic. This one blocks the action of acetylcholine in the CNS to help normalize the acetylcholine dopamine imbalance. Treatment for Parkinson's and extra pyramidal symptoms. Remember this guy? The guy with the EPS who came in the ED there, they thought he was doing, he, was, he did some drugs. They didn't know what it was, but after a minute they said, oh, that's not drugs, that's EPS. Let's give him this. Well, now we're gonna talk about this. Remember, they gave this patient uh, Benadryl and something else. This is that something else. Oh, this is that something else. Benstropine, cogentin or benstropine. So a combination of these two drugs is the best cocktail for our EPS patient. Same, there's that one, two, one, two combo to take this guy out, to make him back to normal. If you notice, within minutes, he was back to normal because we'd use the right combination drug for him. And he knew that. I think he's been through it many times. Other drugs that we use are biperidine, procyclidine. We don't, these are not commonly prescribed drugs. So what you need to focus on this one are the top two, uh, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, and benstropine. benstropine. Eh, same stuff here, absorbed in the GI tract, peaks in a couple of hours, metabolized in the river. Yeah. All right. Contraindications for this one. It's almost the same. Allergies, glaucoma, GI obstruction, GU obstruction, and uh, BPH. Same with the caution, which is not a contra contraindication. Dysrhythmia, hypertension, hypotension, hepatic dysfunction, because this is how the body metabolizes it, and pregnancy. Thing. No, click, won't click. Nursing considerations. We need a good H and P. Same as the other medication. Need a good H and P um, assessment. And that's it. That's it's about the same for the other ones. Here's the drug card for our benstropine. Okay. So benstropine in combination with, um, with Benadryl is our antidote for um, our EPS syndrome. Remember that. Other drugs that we use are entacapone and talcapone, and also this one, selegiline. This one is only used when the levodopa is no longer working. We burned up all the receptor cells. They won't, the levodopa is not working anymore. So this is the last, last choice for these patients. Anti-Parkinson's drugs are safe for pregnant and lactating women. True, false, maybe, only if they're high risk. False, false, false. A, false, false, false. It says true, but no, you guys are correct. I kind of misplaced the, my circle there. 
I was half an inch off at the top. You're right, you're right, it's false. So if you're taking a mental picture of this slide, it's false. Next one. I don't know, I think I mentioned this one so many times. A client has been taking levodopa for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. What additional medication may they take to decrease the amount of levodopa needed to reach therapeutic level in the brain, thus reducing the adverse effects of the levodopa? If you don't remember it, I don't know, I said it 20 times already, carbidopa. If you want to know what it does, here, you can read it, but we talked about it already. All right, now we're starting to get into the good stuff. Muscle relaxants. The best muscle relaxant is a massage. But let's review how the muscles work. Hey, I don't want to do a review of muscles work. You guys know your anatomy. You've been, you've been through the uh, AMP classes. If not, you're in the wrong program. I don't know how you got here. Let's skip through all these anatomy stuff. You can look these up, anatomy, if you're interested. I want to talk about some drugs. Here we go. Muscle spasms, spas Ticity and contraction. You guys have probably experienced muscle spasms like this before. Um, this is bad. It's just quirking. And if this is you, I've had spasms before. You just breathe and breathe, try your best to stretch it out. And eventually, at least from my experience, eventually it goes away. Maybe I didn't have enough potassium that day. Maybe I don't even know, it just spasm. So these muscle spasms may be caused by muscle or skeletal damage. It can also be caused by damaged motor neurons. So what do we do with these patients? What can we give them? We gotta give them something, especially if these things happen all the time. Um, people with back spasms, oh, that's the worst, I had that had that experience crossing the street one time and that sucked. So for these guys, we have baclofen and carisperidol. What it does, these are centrally acting skeletal muscle relaxants. What they do is they inhibit GABA receptors and alleviate spasticity. They are mainly used for spinal cord diseases such as uh, cerebral palsy. Adverse effect of these medications are CNS depression and GI issues. So your patient's gonna be drowsy, dizzy, maybe hypotensive, insomnia, or they might be constipated and nauseated. Here's another one, dentroline. It's another option for muscle sp spasm. But instead of being a, uh, a uh, CNS relaxant, this is a direct acting muscle relaxant. What it does is interferes with the release of calcium, stopping, oops, stopping the uh, sp spasm from uh, happening. The uses of dentroline, muscle spasms from cerebral palsy. I don't know if you've seen a, a cerebral palsy patient, Maybe you know somebody, met somebody, know of somebody, but they're, they're contracted. And sometimes when they're contracted, they go into spasms. And because usually contracted is the, uh, the baseline and uh, we give them this medication to kind of to relax them a little bit so they can open up. Um, which is a segue for the next part of the program. This medicine is also used for malignant hyperthermia and that happens in the OR. So what is this malignant hyperthermia thing? It is a life-threatening pharmacologic 
reaction to, oh, it's a life-threatening reaction to anesthesia. It is characterized by hypermetabolism. And so the patient's bl uh, not blood pressure temperature typically goes up. 103, 104, 105, 107. That is why it is dangerous. Okay. So as a nurse, it is your job, um, especially if you're working in the uh, pre-admission pre -admission testing, um, it is your job to learn everything about this patient. I don't know if any of you guys had surgery before, but you went to the clinic first. They evaluated you, you talked to them, or maybe you talked to them over the phone. Tell me everything about you. Um, one question we ask um, is uh, if they had reaction to anesthesia before. Because uh, if we ask a patient if they had malignant hyperthermia before, they're not going to know what that is. And um, so from your end as a nurse, and you find, and the patient tells you, oh, yeah, I had a surgery, I don't know, say five years ago for my shoulder, and uh, I had a reaction to anesthesia. My temperature went up. My blood pressure went down. Um, and they were having a hard time. Um, reversing that. So as a nurse, it is your job. You can document that in the chart, but you must notify the physician immediately, especially the surgeon and the anesthesia person, uh, the anesthesiologist or the CRNA, because uh, it is a, um, a dangerous side effect of the anesthesia. So the anesthesia or the surgeon may need to reevaluate the if the surgery is needed really really needed for the patient they might need to do something else or, or maybe have extra personnel extra medications extra stuff they need to prepare for this person just in case they have this reaction to the um, to anesthesia you can document it all you want in the chart but if you guys don't know this yet, physicians do not read our the nursing notes, rarely. And I say once in a blue moon. Um, it's typically us, nurses to nurses, who read our documentation. So documenting it in the chart is not enough. You really have to talk to them personally to stop this from happening. Dentrolene is toxic to the liver. It is contraindicated in patients with liver disease, liver transplant patients, and drinkers or heavy drinkers. So some of you may not even uh, be eligible to receive this medication. Adverse effect, rash, urinary frequency, hepatitis, and having some cardiac, some tachycardia. So this is what we're looking for when they have adverse effect from this medication. All right, let's talk about anesthesia. Not the medication itself, but how to take care of these patients under general anesthesia. Number one, the goals of anesthesia is to provide analgesia. To provide analgesia, get you unconscious, and also give you amnesia. If you have surgery, if I'm gonna have surgery, haven't had surgery, knock on marble, but I don't wanna feel anything. I don't wanna know anything. I don't wanna remember anything. Let's say if I have a soldier surgery, that can be brutal. They have to cut open my shoulder, dislocate some shoulder. Maybe I need like a metal ball to put in my shoulder. That, that is brutal. I don't wanna know anything about that. And this is why your CRNAs and anesthesiologists get paid the big bucks so the surgeons can do their job giving you a new heart, liver, lungs, doing surgery on you. Let's talk about local anesthesia. Lidocaine is a big one. 
It is typically used for infiltration, um, peripheral, sympathetic nerve blocks, spinal, local, but mainly it's for local anesthesia. You guys remember when we went to the, uh, when you guys went to the dentist's office, they have light, they give you some lidocaine. For patients, maybe they have like a, a laceration or something and they need stitches or staples. First, the physician is going to inject uh, some lidocaine and um, before they start stitching up or stapling something on your face, shoulder, shoulder or wherever. It provides um, local anesthetic. Another use for this local anesthetic is cardiac. It is one of the medications we use if somebody is in VTAC. It numbs the heart and it kind of resets it back to normal. But that's a different topic. We'll get to that when we get to cardiac. Lidoburns. It looks like Morgan had a lidocaine before. Here's another, um, when you get to your clinical setting and you have a uh, patient who is afraid of needles and you need to put an IV in them, they're gonna ask you, can you give me some lidocaine before you put, put that uh, IV in me? The answer is no, we can't do that. We don't have that. So, and another one is, uh, once in a while, depending on the facility, they might have the lidocaine jelly. So who is that? So when we put in that NG tube last week, if this patient was awake and alert, I'm, and they, the, the facility had lidocaine jelly available, I may have opted to use that on the patient trying to insert the NG tube. It's a kind of catch 22, because if I numb their, if I numb it too much, they're not gonna feel it up here, but when they get to the back of the throat, they're not gonna feel that either, but I kind of want them to feel it so they can swallow it. So we have to do a juggling game. But we don't have that uh, at Valley Hospital, we didn't have that. Actually, we don't have that in any of the um, Valley Health System, Henderson, Desert Springs, Valley, Spring Valley. And when we do use it, the physicians use it for, um, for local anesthetic, this is the main thing we are looking for. A local reaction, redness, maybe there's a rash there. Something's happening at the skin level. Other reactions are hypotension, incontinence, and seizure, but I've been doing this for a very long time. I've never seen any of the uh, hypotension, all the other stuff. It's mainly the uh, topical response. All right, general anesthesia. This is administered by the anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist. We're not gonna talk about anesthesia, but how to take care of these patients after they receive the anesthesia. Some of you may even end up working in a uh, post-anesthesia care unit or PACU. Good, but I'm not sure though, because I think they need experience to be in that for you to get in, uh, in PACU. I think, I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. And what these uh, nurses in the PACU does is they monitor the patients for adverse effect of the general anesthesia. And the major adverse effect of it is respiratory depression. If the patient had a 12, 18 hour spinal surgery, you know, they were intubated, they were breathing through a machine, and now they're coming at you with no more, with breathing on their own, barely breathing on their own. So we had to monitor if they're them waking up and stimulating their respiratory system so they can breathe on their own. Bronchospasm too, if they had a tube down their throat for a few hours, it might cause them spasms. Have you ever, if some of, 
if some of you have uh, ever wondered why your patient is NPO after surgery, it's because when they go under general anesthesia, their GI pretty much shuts down. It's turned off. So when you're listening to bowel sounds, especially post-op, we're listening to bowel sounds, we're listening to see if the, um, the belly has turned back on and that's our cue that they can have, have water, juice, food that they can eat because their belly, their, their GI tract is working again. It may take some time for some patients or some patients that as soon as they get out of anesthesia or PACU, they're okay eating a sandwich. So it's patients dependent. Another side effect that you should be um, monitoring is hypotension. All these anesthesia drugs, most of them causes hypotension. And I talked about this already. We're monitoring them for malignant hyperthermia. Um, I think who is that? Summerlin, I'm not sure, the Summerlin group. I'm not sure if we've had a patient yet that's freshly post-op during our shift, but when we do, I'm sure we're gonna get it one of these days. Pay attention to the vital signs monitoring of that patient. They're gonna plug this patient up to the monitor, to the blood pressure thingy machine, and they're gonna monitor the blood pressure let's say every 15 minutes for the first couple of hours, then every 30 minutes, then every hour. It's a frequent monitoring for hypotension. One thing you need to remember for these patients is these patients are gonna be confused. They're gonna be, if any of you guys had surgery before, um, when you get out of surgery, you're waking up, you wanna get up. I don't know where I am, you wanna get up. So safety is your number one job for these, for these patients. And also uh, their neuro status, they're gonna be confused. I think I uh, had a student in the uh, other group said he came out of uh, surgery and he pulled out his ET tube, he pulled out his stuff, David, after dentist, okay. So this guy, I think it was Jeff, he said he pulled out his ET tube, which was a big mistake because with this ET tube, it has, a, it has a balloon at the end and it can damage your vocal cords. Obviously it didn't damage just, or this person's vocal cords, but it, there's a, the potential is there because we're all about safety. So safety and their neuro status are a big thing to focus on with these, um, patients under general anesthesia. Uh, balance anesthesia. These guys are getting different kinds of gases, different types of medications. It not, it's not just one drug that they get. They get a combination of everything. That's why we have to monitor them. You guys as nurses will have to monitor them very, very closely, because you're not just looking for one drug side effects, this, 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 this. So hopefully we will be allowed to do, to rotate to one of these places so you can see the monitoring that's involved with these patients. Next, let's talk about some neuromuscular, neuromuscular junction blocking agent or succinicoline. We call this in the hospital SOX. It's not that this medicine SOX, it's just a shorter name for succinicoline. This is a skeletal muscle relaxant, attaches to the acetylcholine receptor site, causing a prolonged depolarization of the muscle. Prolonged depolarization of the muscle means everything shuts down we are paralyzing this patient. They have no control of anything, Ooh, including their breathing. So we, if this is given to a patient, we have to support their breathing. We mainly use this for uh, if we're intubating somebody anyway. It has a high potential for malignant hyperthermia. 
So when you get to the hospital setting, you're gonna see a rapid response, code blues. Next semester, you'll probably have your um, critical care rotation. There's a, there's a box that these guys carry with them. And that box is the RSI kit, Rapid Sequence Intubation Kit. And what's in that box? Socks. Socks is in that box because um, this box is carried anywhere there's, a, there's an emergency. If I have, I don't know, if I have a patient in, on the fifth floor in respiratory distress and they need to be intubated, this is the drug we need for that patient. Remember, this drug will paralyze the patient momentarily, enough for us to do whatever we need to do to intubate the patient. So this drug in combination with this drug, etomidate is the perfect combination for to intubate my patient. Because the etomidate on the right, this is a uh, sedative. I don't want my patient to know what's going on. They're already in resp respiratory distress. They're freaking out because they can't breathe. They probably think they're gonna die. And I wanna sedate this patient. After my patient is sedated, I wanna paralyze you for a minute so we can, so we can intubate you. So this is a typical combination drug to intubate our patient. There's that one-two combo again. I love my one-two combo. It works well. So with this one-two combo, this is what we use to intubate our patient. I'm not sure if you've covered this yet or probably next semester with uh, in critical care. When you're intubating a patient, you're trying to put a straw, a tube about the size of my pinky into the patient's uh, trachea. So it is precise and uh, it is precise and you only, you have seconds to do this. Anesthesia, respiratory, advanced practice nurse, the docs, you have seconds to do this. And uh, since if you remember your anatomy, trachea and esophagus, the bigger hole is the esophagus, there's a higher chance that this tube goes in the, into the esophagus. So if your breathing tube is in the esophagus and not in the lungs, there's a big problem there. That means we either have to start over or we're not ventilating our patient. So we're not really breathing for the patient. That's why we have our sucks, succinicoline that we use to paralyze our patient only for a minute or two or three. When I say paralyze our patient, this is a short period. Um, I'm gonna take you all the, oops, hey, what happened? There. So down here, rapid sequence intubation, based on the dosage, this medication will paralyze, will start working within 45 seconds and will only work for a few minutes, 10 minutes or less. So I need to intubate my patient, boom, 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 and start ventilating for them, start connecting them to the, uh, to the ventilator. And also for short procedures, uh, certain doses are given that last a little shorter, but for long procedures, such as let's say open heart surgery, spinal surgery, we can infuse these in, in a drip. Nursing consideration for these medications. Safety, safety, safety. If I haven't said safety yet, safety, because they are a high risk for injury, okay? So this is what, it, if you haven't seen anybody that's post-op, this is what it looks like. They're loopy. They probably just took the airway, the ET tube off of her. They're talking to her. Sit up, sit up, I need to look at your wound. I need you to do this, but how what? I don't, I hear voices. I don't, what's happening? Are you looking at my surgical thing? What are you doing? I'm trying to be awake, but I can't. She's loopy. And there's no way this person can function. She's trying to talk to them, but nah, nothing coherent is coming. It's coming out of her mouth. 
And as she wakes up more, she's going to be more coherent. And you can, she's probably going to feel more pain when that, when that happens. So uh, now it's a balance, uh, balancing act of pain medicine and, um, and anesthesia and sedation. So I talked about Parkinson's disease. What to do with these patients? EPS, what's my drug combinations for EPS? Kind of need to know that thing. Muscle relaxants and also nursing considerations for these uh, muscle relaxants. And also our anesthesia, local anesthetic or general anesthesia. Not specifically the medicine itself, but what to do with these patients. And last but not the least, you are now ready for the test. Questions? No? Good. Thanks. Have a good day. Are we free to go? No, not yet. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to have questions. I know you're going to have questions, so I'm ready for it. Oh, test. I forgot. Test. We're doing a live testing on campus next week. And I'm going to give you the, the room number. It's probably on the second floor. And uh, I'll give you the room number when I, as I, when I get it. What day are we doing the test? Same day. Uh, what is it now? Monday? Tuesday? Same. Same. <laughs> Professor Texan, can I just say something about doing a live testing? Mm -hmm. So I'm not in? trying to be disrespectful. My name is Amy. Um, but like two months before the semester even started, we reached out to the school to find out if tests were in person because 75% of the moms in here have kids. Mm -hmm. And then we kept asking, we kept asking, we were told it was in person. And then at the beginning of the semester, when we went over, I mean, we were told it was online. And then at the beginning of the semester, when we went over it with you, you said it was online too. So none of us figured out childcare. And then more than that, like, yeah, we don't have childcare for, I mean, I, I, if we have to figure it out, I guess we have to figure it out, but it's summer. And so when we were planning our schedules, I mean, we asked this ahead of time so that we could sort it out. And then now to have to figure it out in a week it's frustrating and it's difficult, especially with situations like there's people in here that ride the bus, people in here that share cars, people in here that have multiple children. And I don't really know how we're supposed to swing that. All right. Well, I'm okay. I'm easy. I'm flexible. If that's the case, let me know if you're, there's any issues like this or the bus, daycare stuff. Let me know and we'll work it out. What does that mean? Because we're working on I will, because I, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you almost all of the women in here are mothers. And I heard that from your morning semester too, they were texting, freaking out about it. And I like, I'm, I mean, I'm in nursing school to be less poor. So okay. it's hard to hire for summer like daycare when we already are doing it for clinicals and for skills. And now to have to, you know, if we have to do another $60 a day for childcare, Oh, when shit. we just did our ten thousand dollars of tuition, like I know it seems so small, but for like us as families, it's really difficult. See, why why didn't they they didn't bring this up to me? I'm glad you're bringing it up to me. I wouldn't I mean, have known if uh, they didn't. If, if you, you didn't, yeah. and that's why we were asking like two months into last semester, we were saying, "Can you tell us? Can you tell us?" I mean. We've collectively, we've written data and we've gone to all of the higher ups and they all said, don't worry, it's not going to be till fall. So for a lot of us, like if we're single parents or if our husbands are working, I share a car with my husband, which means like I have to figure out daycare. And then I also have to get an Uber to school. Like it's just, it's frustrating when we did our due diligence and tried to plan our schedules. And then that changes last minute. And I know you guys have the right to do that. But we are a caring science school, so like, we need help. We're, we need to have, you know, I don't know. 
I don't mean I to know. be difficult. I really don't mean to be difficult. I'm just. No, no, this is, I, I wouldn't have known this. Talking to the other group, if they only said something, nobody said anything. But they didn't say it to you because they were nervous, but they texted it to everybody else. Ner- Maybe because they don't know me. Yeah, I just know him via screen. I'm, I I told him, I'm like, listen, I watch his TikToks. He seems really cool. He seems really nice. He's not scary. So I am scary. Be scary. But uh, well, okay. They, Professor, would we be able to maybe do the first exam online just to give everyone a chance to figure out uh, the child that, care? Though, like even that, it's $60 a day for child care. And I know that they're going to say, well, we have the right and you guys have, you know, you should have known, but like we have been so flexible with COVID. And then when we finally get a new routine where maybe our husbands are working around our school schedule, but then now they have their work schedules planned out. For us, it's just, we thought this semester we were home. So when I was planning my schedule with my husband, he does his, you know, with his work, he does a month out. It was, I'm home these days. We don't need childcare these days, but we need full childcare. These other three, I mean, we're already paying $500 a week in childcare for me to go to school. So I'm just frustrated and I'm venting to you as my professor because in the beginning when we went over the syllabus, you know, you had us do the lockdown test and we all thought we were on lockdown. So I know it's just like, oh, it's no big deal. It's one day, but it is like for me, it's a big deal. And I know for a lot of the other moms in here, it's a big deal. Or even like you have some moms in here that are pregnant, you know, it's a big deal. It's hard. It's, so I don't know. That's my two cents. If it's a big deal for you, it only takes one person. So uh, I will. I think everything Amy is saying is felt like I mean, a lot of moms here have are feeling the same. Have triplets that it's not, you know, it's not just one child care. It's three there's you know and most of the most of the women in here are moms okay we've pretty much been an experiment group and guinea pigs for this whole covid and the way that they've redone everything so it's put on undue stress onto us every single time something changes it makes it harder for everyone with a lot more stress like in fall my mom is moving in with me to watch my daughter because we're anticipating being on campus but for summer they told us we're still online and every other professor we're online. You're the only professor that said we're in person. So now I'm like, hey babe, like get more ramen noodles because I need more Uber money and childcare money. And it's just- Okay, Amy, I do not want to add any more stress from your life. In fact, I want to take away from your stress. So cancel this. I'm making an executive decision right now. We're no in-person testing. Thank Take you. this stress off your table. Thank you so much, Professor. Is that for the so sorry for being so dramatic, dramatic, but no, it's yeah, just take it off the schedule. No stress. I don't, I don't just, yeah. Professor. Don't need to do that. So for the rest of the semester, we'll just do the testing online. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank Let's you. do that right now, period. Thank Boom. you so much, thank you, you. You can tell, I guess I'll tell the other group, I'll, I'll send them an email too, you can tell them too. So, but I am glad you said something. Where are you, Amy? I'm glad, because I wouldn't have known that. They didn't speak up to me. I asked that, I said, did anyone say anything? And they were all crying. They were like, no, nobody said anything because we were too shocked, but they were texting all of us about it. So everybody was freaking out on the down low. What? Somebody texted me, oh, I have a question about the test. Okay, and that was it. Nobody asked me about, I, I wouldn't have known that. I thought everybody was okay. There we go. Lesson learned, speak up. I know a few of you don't have any issues speaking up. I know there's one in the corner right there. She doesn't have any uh, problems speaking up. And also down there at the bottom. You can't see my screen, but you know who you are. What else? So there's that. I'm okay with that. I don't want to add any more stress into your life. I want to take away stress. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Because it's just, um, when was it yesterday? We had our, um, our testing day. 
for the other group, the graduating group of himself and on campus. So, but it's okay. We don't have to do that. I don't have to follow their lead. We're good. Good job, Amy. So whoever it is from the other group, they all owe you a cup of coffee or something. No, they owe, owe you five bucks a piece for speaking Your out. Uber money. There we go. Because I the really wouldn't, noodles. <laughs> wouldn't have known that. And you can tell them if they have any questions, just ask me. It's candid. They can call me if they don't want to be on the spot. Some of you guys know me. I'm fairly casual. I think I'm approachable. You're totally approachable. Who said that? I did, Julie. Oh, except for me. No. <laughs> right. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> um. Any other questions? Well, you owe me ramen. So, kind of like. Ramen. Do you think that we're gonna go back to? We are gonna go back to in person in the fall because some of us do learn better in person. I know. Yeah, I do. I know. I would prefer you in person. I want to see you. I want to see your eyes. I want to tap you in the shoulder to see if you're awake. Also, just for like interaction, like being like in the social and with you and like doing like stuff like in person with the instructor. I think a lot of us learn better that way. Yeah. But in fact, when, when we had our first, our graduating students from yesterday who had, we did their math test live, um, we realized that this was the first time all throughout nursing school that they were taking a live test, which was kind of scary. But we worked through it. We're good now. So yeah, next semester should be back to normal. The campus felt weird too. It was empty. Some people were wearing masks, some were not. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question. We have um, our exam. As a student, how would you be preparing for the exam? You don't need to prepare. You're good, Jose. I got you. You're good. Just give me a. Just Do you just got Jose or everybody else? I'm just talking to, to Jose. It's a guy thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. No, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, I'm prepared for you guys. This, let me give you a quick review. If you have not been visiting my, my farm guide, my Google Doc, I highly recommend you do because I add stuff to that. Actually, I didn't do it last week, but my review, I'm gonna read to you guys my review. What do you need to know? Review. I'm just gonna read it off the Google Doc. I need to know, you need to know phenophar, phenobarbital side effects and what you should monitor for. You also need to know reversal agents. I hope you're not writing these down it's because it's on the Google Doc. I'm just reading it. Reversal, Wait, the reversal agents. Um, there's a handful, a couple of reversal agents for certain drugs. I'm not gonna tell you which one they are, but, and also if you're looking at my Google Doc, I have some abbreviation there that I use. And if you're not familiar with them, ask me. It's like, what is this? Phenobarbital SE. That's fairly straightforward. Side effects. Uh, GABA. Oh, I threw that in there. What, what does it do? I think, and also um, during the waiting period to start the class, I usually have um, like a bonus nugget at the waiting screen. That's kind of something. It's not just a random thing I posted up there. Um, I have some medications that I like because it doesn't have, oh, I'm not gonna tell you the why because that kind of pretty much answers the question. There's this medication too that people take and uh, all right, it puts them to sleep and but there's some side effect attached to it. Uh, I told you guys to remember generic names, but there was this 
one question. I, I, I couldn't change it because it goes with the storyline. And it was a good question. There was this one question that it says, a gen it was asking about a generic name and a trade name. Um, I guess you can look on my thing there. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Just know the generic name and trade name of that. There is a storyline attached to it and it's going to go, oh yeah, that's, that's what it was about. Some side effects of the SSRIs. Um, mainly the, the test is about knowing the drugs, um, what they do, because I'm more into the applicability, especially when, we, when you get to the clinical setting, because if you're not in my clinical group, we don't even talk about the GABA receptors, the beta blocker uh, beta receptors. When we go, we get to the patient, this is your blood pressure medicine, Mrs. Jones. This is your, your blood thinner, Mrs. Jones. They don't know about the platelet inhibitors. And we, that's for you to know for testing purposes. But for my patient, they don't know what that is. So what else is here? To, TCAs, what it does. And I talked about some foods. I think I only talked about one kind of food, so that should be fairly easy. I have a side effects there of some SSRIs. There's some medications there that are used, not just for antidepressants, but for something else. So know about what be something else. And there's not a whole list of something else. It's just a couple. Mm, what is that one? If you, oh, somebody asked me earlier, what is POC? Do you guys know what POC, abbreviation POC? Anybody? What is POC? Plan of care. Plan of care. There it is. You should know what my plan of care for these patients receiving these certain drugs. Hmm family stuff, lithium, please look over lithium because it's kind of important and it's highly toxic. And we get, we have patients with that uh, on lithium. I think um, at least at the Valley Hospital, we have patients with um, a lot of um, on psych meds or anti-depression meds. I don't know, maybe it's equal over at Summerlin. Because the difference with the Summerlin and the Valley patient population is actually the acuity is much higher over at S Valley. Oh, um, I talked about combination drugs. There's only a handful of combination drugs. Know what they are. Combination drugs, phenytoin side effect, which labs to monitor. Nah, you can take that. I took that question off because that's kind of delete. Oh, I won't delete. 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 There we go. It's deleted. Onset of these medications. How to deal with these patients uh, from children to young adults to elderlies try not to give it away but combination drugs of the parkinson's i just talked about this about 30 minutes ago and there's also oh ro anybody know what ro stands for r o Gorgeous, you know what RO stands for? It's R of something. <laughs> because you said HO is history of, so I'm guessing RO. It's rule out. Rule out. Rule out. So I, have, I may have a list of conditions here. Which one of these conditions rules out my patient, rules this patient out that I cannot use this drug on them? Oh, you have this, so I can't use this out. That's an automatic rule out for this patient. I may have just talked about that. Goal, side effects, some terminologies there that I talked about. 
about Parkinson's, muscle spasm drugs, post-op. I, I have a question real quick. I'm sorry. This is what really stresses me out about pharmacology is that you have all of these individual drugs. So do you want us to just focus on the categories themselves? Because that's what makes gets me overwhelmed is that you have like 15 or 20 different drugs that kind of do the same thing, but they're kind of different. And then it just feels like you have to memorize a million different things. So is it better to start on the, like the classes of drugs and then try to narrow it down to like the most popular used ones or just that know would be a little a bit good, about everyone? Yeah, that would be a good one. It, Cause especially today I said, um, uh, these are the most widely prescribed medication for, I don't know, let's say Parkinson's. And there's five other ones. I really didn't talk about that because there's minimal usage for those. They, they, we don't use this as much. We don't see those as much. So uh, yes, focus more on the, uh, the most common drugs. How will you know which ones they are? Probably the top two, three maybe, if, it, if there's a list. Thank like, you. Uh, let's say Valium would be a common one because everybody knows what Valium is. Uh, lorazepam, those are common drugs that you guys, at least, uh, okay, maybe I'm wrong. Those are common to me. So if it's not common to you, it's the top few drugs. I've noticed that all the drugs you talked about and the only ones you really talked about were on Professor Call's list. Is that correct in thinking that? Are on Professor Call's list? I have not, I only scanned her list uh, before I started this. So uh, if it's the same, then I guess we're all up, we're both on, on the same page. Yeah, it's pretty much all the same. Every drugs that you're talking about, they're all the ones that are on that list and you haven't talked about other ones really, so. There we go. What's, so what's the problem now? So this is cake then. You have two guides that you can use. But I would use mine because uh, my test is off of this thing. Just a tip. But it's the same information though. Uh, what else? What else is on this thing? Let me go to page two, history, history. Local anesthesia, what to look out for, malignant hyperthermia, sucks. I don't have a question on sucks on there yet. So I'm going to have to add that. Any suggestion? What question should I add on the sucks? You can word it for me. Maybe. A question about like what you would give it with to do the intubation, that other one that starts be. with the E. It could be. Or what to look for. I like the what to look for because when it's what you guys will be doing when you become nurses. It adds a little bit of realism to it. Uh, ooh, antidepressants for a child. What do we do with that? And if you, um, if you look over the slides, um, these are all there. Because I'm not going to test you on something I don't talk about. And if you downloaded my slides, uh, you, there's, a power, there's a PowerPoint presentation. I also write my notes on the side. So if you're not looking at my notes, sometimes I press the button here and I just start talking because I'm not going to remember my notes and it types it on the slide. So um, pay attention to the notes because sometimes um, uh, I don't have much stuff on the slides, but on the notes, because I don't know, I guess I would like to tell more stories than read what's on the slides. How many questions are going to be on the exam? 50, two points a pop. Can you be honest, what's your average grade for the first exam and the students? I don't know. This is my first time doing this test, so uh, you are my guinea pig. Well, thanks. <laughs> no, like when you were in person, like, did you see like, uh, a check? No, I don't want to tell you. Please? 
No. Uh, in person. Why? No, uh, there's a lot of factors that's involved, but uh, yeah, we can talk about that tomorrow or the next day, whenever I see you. Because it was well, the first be... time, there's some stuff that eh, it's okay. So focus on, uh, there's also some terminologies there on the page two of the form. And uh, look at that. This is right there. Focus on that. Focus, focus. Are all the questions multiple choice? I think I have multiple, a few multiple multiples. You mean select all that apply? Yeah. What was that again? Select all that apply? Yeah. Okay. Select all that applies. Or the, I don't think I have the, the tricky one. Select the best answer. I try to stay away from those. What else? What else? Who is this? Anything else? Any other questions? If there's anything, if you have there's something on the review sheet or any of the materials you need clarification, question. Uh, for, as I told the other group, even though they, I didn't have my number, I gave them my number. Please text me. Because if you email me through the canvas, I don't know if my setting is uh, off. Um, can we go so we can have, why do you need a cry break? Who's, Julie, why do you need a cry break? There's no cry break, it's a celebration. It would be a good healthy cry at this point, you know, just let the stress go and then refocus. <laughs> just no need for a cry break, you need a coffee break. But uh, as I told the other group, text me if you have any, uh, questions, clarification, if you don't understand anything, because if you try to email me through the canvas, I, I can't see it until I log in because I, I don't know, I don't get the notification unless you e text me or uh, email me through the uh, main school website. I had a question. So for the, um, the exam, so you got, it's not done yet, right? You're still gonna add some stuff for this week. Or it's it done, but it's done, but um, I think I'm gonna add something else. We'll take something out and then replace it with uh, some of this stuff I wanna cover. Maybe okay. one or two questions. Why, are you gonna hack my computer if it was done or something? No, I was just seeing, cause I was, I was gonna start filling it out, but I just wanted to make sure, cause you have to make a copy of it to be able to edit it since it's like a live document. So ah, as far as on it, I just didn't want to miss anything that was on the study guide. Ah, no, um, I added it already. I, I don't have questions there that involves the socks and the local anesthesia. So I just added it at the bottom. Okay. So if you haven't, if you don't see it, you can click refresh or maybe I need to click refresh. Okay. Thank you. Where do we access your lecture recordings again? I was trying to find them, but I can't. Oh. I should stop, probably stop this. Wait a minute. Stop, stop, stop. How do I stop this? Stop. Hang on one second. Stop. I guess not since I can't stop it. Oh, there. Stop recording.